is really critical to designing uh, effective projects. So um, again, I'm, I'm gonna start to introduce our panelists, but a few items. If you have questions, please post them on the World Bank Live website, or uh, you can also post them on the Twitter feed, which is hashtag she is connected. Uh, we already have a really great group of questions. Um, and we'll also have our World Bank digital ex gender expert, Sharada, that will post um, some responses or relative resources to the questions uh, that we don't get to today. Um, and we'll also be live blogging the event, so feel free to retweet uh, using that same hashtag, she, uh, hashtag she is connected. So let me start with an introduction from our Director of Digital Development, Ruthena. Um, she leads all of the World Bank's work in digital infrastructure and also spearheads the application of digital technologies across the World Bank's portfolio. She's been a fantastic champion, champion for gender issues, and we're really lucky to have her here today. Um, so one of the objectives of the challenge, as I mentioned, is to find new solutions and ideas that Buthana and her team can use as they design digital infrastructure projects and solutions in developing countries. So Buthana, let me turn it over to you first. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this online dialogue. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today uh, to talk about a topic that is very close to my heart, bridging the gender digital divide. As a woman working in this field for a few years now, uh, I find it really difficult to imagine a world of inclusive digital development where women are not active players, active users, producers, creators of content and digital solutions. And in many cases, they cannot do it because they do not have access to digital technology and digital tools and digital connectivity. I'm also extremely happy to share this virtual floor with three exceptional panelists, uh, Amroti, Sonia, and Regina, who have not only championed the cause, but also walked the talk and made a lot of contributions in closing the gender digital divide. And we will hear more from them in a minute. I'm very excited to co-host this event with CES. Uh, as Ed mentioned, uh, this is the largest, most influential tech event in the world and a proven ground for breakthrough technologies and global innovators. Uh, last fall, we partnered with CES on a global tech challenge uh, to mobilize the tech community worldwide to solve developmental challenges. And I cannot think of a better cause than contributing to closing the gender digital divide. This is particularly important in these difficult times as we cope or try to cope with the coronavirus when digital technologies have become clearly a lifeline. Uh, the sector indeed came to the rescue uh, by providing tools for governments to offer service, uh, for businesses to continue working, uh, for kids to continue education. Uh, it also brought to the fore, like no other time before, the stark reality of the digital divide. The new usual is only possible if countries, governments, businesses, and citizens have the tools to hook up to this virtual world. As we look deeper into the digital divide, we see, unfortunately, that the crisis may, in fact, reinforce the gender digital divide, including through its impact on girls' education. Without access, you know, girls cannot continue online education. In some cases, because of social norms, and if there is one computer in the household, maybe the priority will not be given to the girl. And in cases where, you know, women cannot afford a SIM card or cannot afford a device, they cannot even get the cash transfers and the social protection schemes that are very important in the context of COVID-19. So now is the time to do something about it and use this crisis to give a new boost, a new urgency for this topic. I'm sure you're all familiar with how deep is this divide and Ed shared with us a few numbers. I mean, we know that 300 million fewer women then men in low and middle income countries have access to mobile internet. This is roughly about the population of the US. We know that 51% in South Asia, South Asia is still the, the, the region of the world with the widest gender gap. 
This is followed by Africa at 37%. So why should we be worried? Simply because the digital divide could increasingly prevent, prevent women from accessing life-enhancing services for education, for health, for financial inclusion, in a world that has become virtual overnight. So as the digital transformation affects economies and changes the way we work and we interact and we live, strategies to make sure technology becomes a great equalizer are very important. Unfortunately, failure to address this divide, technology and digital in general can become a reason for deeper inequalities. And when we talk about digital inequalities, this really can exacerbate other inequalities, hampering the opportunities for women to contribute to the labor force, to attain new skills, to access information. So we need intervention that leverage digital technologies through concerted efforts to tackle both the economic and the normative barriers to really help women contribute more to the economy and to contribute to the women's economic and social empowerment. There are a number of examples out there of how technology is helping already. Let me give you a couple of examples. One is the Gram Vani. This is a social tech company in India. Through technology, they really helped bring clearly a very loud message about women's empowerment to millions of people. Another example that I find very interesting is the Rwanda Digital Ambassador Program. This program is bringing digital literacy, literacy to about 17,000 citizens. It helped 75% of its female attendees to adopt digital technologies. So these examples bring optimism that really interventions leveraging digital technology can enable positive change. And this optimism, I think, motivates so many people out there that really think there is a solution to the gender digital divide. Is technology a panacea? No, but it has become essential. Can it be an integral part in our toolkit? Definitely, and I hope this is what we will be discussing in detail today with our panelists. From supporting research to better understand the root causes of the digital gender gap, to designing and implementing innovative programs that promote women's entrepreneurship and make the internet more relevant to them, let us all work together to bridge the stubborn digital gender gap. And at no time in history has it been more important and more urgent than today. I look forward to a great discussion. Uh, thank you so much for connecting. Let me give the floor back to uh, Ed, who will introduce our next presenter and co-host. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Prithena, and, and thank you for those inspirational words. And, and yes, we're hoping this uh, will help us, uh, this event will help us all continue to work together uh, to solve this problem. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our next uh, host, Ellen Savage. She's a vice president at the Consumer Technology Association. And the Consumer Technology Association represents the 422 billion US technology industry and also hosts the Consumer Electronics Show, which is the largest technology show in the world. So at the World Bank, we're very pleased to partner with them as we think their members can help to bring new ideas, resources, and new innovations to help us meet this challenge. Uh, Ellen, let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Ed. It's a pleasure to be here. As Ed um, mentioned, uh, the Consumer Technology Association, which produces um, and owns CES, uh, is the largest technology event in, on the planet. And we're so delighted to have partnered with the World Bank Group on the Global Tech Challenge. Um, this presents an opportunity to galvanize the technology industry to provide solutions to global issues and an important one, um, which we'll talk about today, which is the digital gender divide. We're excited to unite the technology and development communities for the challenge. And we look forward to seeing these finalists um, at CES 2021 in January. So we're pleased to be partners and looking forward to a really um, dynamic discussion today. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ellen. So now I'm going to turn it over to our three panelists. And as Bethana mentioned, we're really fortunate to have this uh, amazing group of panelists today who bring different perspectives from the public and private sector and also from the entrepreneur's perspective. Um, so first, I want to introduce uh, Amrote Abdallah. She is the regional director of Microsoft for Africa initiatives. Uh, Microsoft is a strong partner of the World Bank as part of the Digital Development Partnership, which is a public-private partnership that supports projects in connectivity, data, governance, AI, and other digital applications across the World Bank. And Amroti's role is to help deliver innovative public sector services through digital support and co-funding. We're also pleased to have Amrote as a judge for the challenge. So for those entrepreneurs who are applying, please pay careful attention to what she's about to say. So um, Amrote, uh, we all know Microsoft is a really, uh, a pretty big company. Um, why does Microsoft care about the digital gender divide? We already have one question on the live chat. What is the role of the private sector in bridging, the, in bridging this divide? Uh, so we'd love to hear your perspective. How do you see the problem? And what do you see as Microsoft's role uh, in, in helping uh, be a part of the solution? Excellent. Thank you, Ed. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, allow me first by sharing sort of our approach and, and the way we've been sort of investing and engaging in uh, in uh, in the space, uh, specifically focusing on Africa. When you're looking at the digital gender divide, there are actually three areas that we I think help us streamline and think about the areas of intervention. The first one is around education. The second one is around sort of experience, and then the third one is on the the scaling and the innovation side of it. And let me start by the education. Um, there's a lot of investment that we're driving uh, directly, one in terms of the digitization of content, but also availability of access to tools and platforms within the mainstream of education. And then the second piece is around experience. So programs like uh, DG Girls, uh, our internship programs, uh, are all aimed at providing and encouraging girls to one, look into STEM, but then secondly, stay and encourage them to look at career opportunities. Uh, by finding mentors, by finding opportunities for them to understand the scope of it. Uh, some of the statistics and the numbers that we have have actually uh, are actually quite staggering, right? From 28% uh, in terms of field employment and engagement to a large number of young girls who actually start into STEM. Uh, so we believe uh, that you know if if you you can't have women in tech if you don't have girls in STEM. And so what are the content? What are the experiences? How do we encourage? How do we continue to promote uh, STEM within the education system is the first. The second one is on the job experience, right? And so for them to successfully land into the tech space, how do we give them the opportunity to have insight? Uh, challenges like uh, make what is next uh, as a campaign is one that really encourages innovation to come from women across the board and allow them to really think innovatively around product development, around business innovation that really allows for the sector to move forward, but for also for them to be able to solve for a problem. Um, and then the third piece is around the innovation, right? So once you have sort of the technical skills, right, and investing very hard in making sure that you are competitive going into the workforce, how do we enable you by providing you the right technical support, the business support as a startup and as an entrepreneur to be able to go into it? And whatever that sector may be, whether you're looking at financial services, whether you're looking at uh, agriculture, education, or any of the other main sectors, how do we allow you to sort of and support in making sure that you become successful? So across those three, um, we see a big opportunity for us to be able to drive it. Now, the question is, what is the role of private sector in making sure that we contribute to uh, the, the bridging of this gap? It's everything. I mean, frankly, I, be, I think it's, it can't be left to uh, government. It can't be left to the civil society. But we all have a role to play in making sure that from our hiring, from our procurement of services, that we actually take a very conscious decision, but one that is integrated in making sure that um, it's part and parcel of our way of doing business. Um, we look at topics like diversity and inclusion. Today, that is a huge topic that, that we are ourselves are sort of looking at and tracking ourselves and our performance against it as well. So from a private sector perspective, it becomes very critical that we take the, the ownership of the accountability in our hiring, in our promotion, in our engagement, but more importantly, in giving visibility um, to make sure that other young girls who are coming are, have uh, someone that they can look up to or a path that they can follow as well. Uh, all that said, all embedded, of course, in the core of the technology that should be sort of part and parcel of the way it's developed, from the development of it to the consumption of it uh, being uh, equally available and accessible as well. 
I'll stop there for now, Ed. Great, thank you so much, Amrote. And, and I really like what you said that you can't have women in tech if you don't have girls in STEM. And as the father of a 10 year old daughter, I'm trying very hard to give her everything she needs to, <laughs> to get into STEM. Um, so let me uh, introduce our next panelist, um, Sonia, who is the executive director of the Alliance for Affordable Internet. And she's also head of the digital inclusion program for the Web Foundation. She's been a really strong ally of the World Bank in being an avid, an avid advocate of gender equality and development. And in her role, she has worked extensively to promote gender analysis and awareness in the ICT planning process, drawing upon her 25 years of ICT policy and regulatory advice. So Sonia, again, thanks for coming. Um, uh, can you tell us what are the trends you're seeing in the digital gender divide? What are the main barriers or issues that need to be addressed to bridge this divide? Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Rufina and Ellen and everyone for having us here. It's really a pleasure. Um, I have to say, unfortunately, I wish I was the, better, the bearer of better news because the, the sad reality is that uh, this divide is not only persistent, and while we see some progress here and there in a couple of countries, the reality is that it's far too wide, um, as Buthina already uh, alerted. And I, I wanted to start by saying that it's not just far too wide, but we cannot see, accept the reality in the world where for example, uh, the gap, the digital gender gap in Bangladesh is about 52%, or that is 40% in Mozambique, or 48% in Uganda, or or even uh, what appears to be not so much compared to those numbers, but 15% in Guatemala or in other parts of the world. And I think that if you start with those kinds of numbers, you realize that we're starting with a reality where women not only have a lot less opportunities they have less access to connectivity and even when they are connected they are not being able to uh, benefit from the kinds of opportunities that we are envisioning and considering as we think about this challenge for example what are, what are solutions for women what can solutions for women look like when women are not even connected and don't have the ability of accessing those solutions so I wanted to start by, um, by saying that I think especially in the context of this crisis, what has been, uh, which has been totally unprecedented and I think really um, unreal for many of us, but it's the fact that it unmasks realities that all, many of us working in the space already knew existed, have been working on for a long time, and, and unfortunately there hasn't been enough attention to it. So. Um, on one hand, uh, we have these, uh, you know, what I would like to call without sounding too alarmist, but really uh, a crisis that is of the same kind of magnitude that are, as the pandemic that we are all living now, but in digital development when it comes to women's inclusion and the possibility of equality. It's, it's really a problem that we have to resolve in new innovative ways. And so, um, not only this crisis has amplified that picture, but it has also um, made me realize that because governments, companies, and, and in fact, some civil society organizations have mobilized quite fast to act in the context of the crisis, that the reality is that we can do things if we want to. And the, the current pandemic has mobilized efforts in a way that was also unprecedented. And it also showed that if you call something a crisis and a pandemic, then people start mobilizing and acting. Why don't we do that on an ongoing basis? Did we really need COVID to show the world that digital equality was the reality that we live in? I don't think we need COVID for that. But because we have it, I think we need to make the best of it. And obviously no one wants to live in this current situation, but how can we turn that around? How can we ask governments from Panama to Uganda to South Africa to not only act about the kinds of policy actions that will bring connectivity to women because there is a crisis, but as part of their day-to-day -day activities in doing policy making that is not only gender responsive, but is addressing the real needs and wants of women and girls in, in their countries, in their regions. And this is the case too in other countries, right? So how do we switch the thinking from only taking action 
when there is this perceived crisis, but actually turning the gender digital divide into not just the perceived crisis, but the reality of ongoing crisis that we all live in. So with that, um, I, I wanted to, to say that one of the things that actually uh, Amrati already kind of alluded to that I think is really important is that we need to integrate diversity in design at all levels of digital development. And this comes from policy. So policy becoming not only diverse, but also very much gender responsive. Tech solutions being also diverse, not only in those who are uh, developing, but also what solutions are being uh, developed. Who are they for? Who is defining the problems? Whose problems are we tackling? Are we tackling problems from those sitting in Silicon Valley? Or are we tackling problems from those sitting in Bangladesh or Mozambique or uh, Algeria, what have you? Um, and, and also um, all of the different kinds of, uh, I would call complements that are necessary for women not only to be connected, but to be connected meaningfully as we say at the Alliance. And so this comes from uh, everything um, including devices, you know, we talk about access and connectivity, as many of you alluded, and I mentioned some of the numbers. Um, but the reality is that even if um, women have the possibility of being connected, we need to make sure that they have the right devices that allow them to then enjoy the kinds of services, applications that folks that Amrate and Regina are working with are providing, right? So it, it's a much more complex ecosystem than just bringing connectivity. Um, and it, it's one that uh, needs to make sure that women and girls um, are connected, are connected with the right devices and also are given all of the, the possibilities and capabilities to take full ad advantage of what those technical solutions bring to them. I will stop there. I have quite a few more to share with you, including some of my favorite examples that show how some of these things are, um, how are they are uh, taking shape in practice by some of those leaders that are thinking about these things uh, well. But I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to you, Ed, and I'll come back in, in a bit again. Thank, thank you, Sonia. And uh, thank you for that uh, reminder that uh, the gender digital divide is an ongoing crisis. Um, um, but um, perhaps we can use this uh, pandemic to really um, make some progress uh, and mobilize efforts in a way that we couldn't before. So there's a sense of urgency now. Um, so let me turn it over now to our, our final panelist, Regina. And Regina is the founder and CEO of Soronko Solutions, which is the first coding and human-centered design school in West Africa for children and adults. Now, Regina, we're very lucky to have you here. She's been ranked one of the top young 50 CEOs in Ghana and was a winner of the Challenging Norms Powering Economies Initiative by Ashoka, UN Women, and Open Society Foundations for work to challenge gender norms and women's economic empowerment. She's truly an inspirational figure, and we're looking forward to hearing from her today. And all of you entrepreneurs who are listening, I think she is your role model. So she is where you want to be uh, in, in five or 10 years. Um, so, Regina, uh, would love if you could tell us more about your story. What is Soronko Solutions and why did you found it? What are the challenges that your students have to overcome to even be a part of your, of your, uh, of your uh, school? And how do you see the impact of COVID-19 affecting your business as well? Thank you, Ed, um, for such a great introduction. So I'm very excited to have the opportunity to share. So um, Shunko Solutions is a technology social enterprise. And like you said, we run Shunko Academy, which is a coding and human-centered design academy um, in West Africa. So for me, my entrepreneurial journey kind of started with a, a lot of self-doubt, which is one of the issues that we see um, with women and girls, me kind of holding myself back and thinking that I wasn't ready or I couldn't do it. And growing up and um, learning about science and technology in school, one of the things that was missing was the practicality. So uh, even though I, I, I fell in love with technology, I didn't have that practical um, aspect of it. The second thing was there were not a lot of, lot of role models. Um, so the people that I aspired to were just Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Those were the only people that I knew um, back then, uh, which was very hard for them to be my reality. So when I finally found the courage, you know, to kind of go into the entrepreneurial space, because once again, 
the socialization at the time was oh you go to work uh, you find a job um, and then you marry so it wasn't i wasn't even socialized that entrepreneurship was a route for me and um, so with me sort of finding the courage to step up into the entrepreneurial world and um, i looked across at what was the main problem and the first thing i identified was that sort of gap when it came to science and technology. And so that was the first approach that I went into. But in my own career as a woman in tech, I suffered discrimination, sexism, loneliness, uh, because within the space, there were not a lot of women. But what was the flip side was there was so much opportunity and I was able to take an innovative idea and impact millions of people just by the click of a button. And so for me, that was a whole new superpower and um, that I had been able to go into technology. So when I started uh, running the business, um, I looked at how I could generate income. So I was building software for small and medium scale enterprises. And interestingly, my first project was called Growing Stems, which was working um, with children. But whenever I took out computers and I was trying to teach STEM skills, it was the boys that participated. The girls kind of sat back, didn't really engage. And in one of the sessions, a boy and a girl come, the boy tells the girl that laptops are not for girls. And the girl says, but I am a girl because I was the one who had the laptop. And so then immediately I realized that in order to connect with more women and girls, they needed to see mentors, role models. So we started off with a project called Tech Needs Girls, which was a mentorship program where we were teaching girls from six to 18 years how to create technology. For me, it was important that, like all the other panelists have said, that we have the female um, sort of perception in creating technology. So with Tech Needs Girls, uh, we run it in several regions. But one of the big challenges that we had was when a community doesn't know what an empowered girl looks like, they beat her down even more. So what would happen is we empower a girl, we give her access to these skills and tools, but you can't just leave her in isolation. Um, you have to sort of have a safe space where she can keep coming to, you have to sort of keep the momentum going. So it isn't just a one-time engagement. Um, I always say that when you work with women and girls um, in, in technology, you're working with them for a lifetime because you have to keep supporting them and helping them as they keep growing and discovering themselves. So with Tech Needs Girls, we, we realized that we had to set up an academy. So we went ahead and set up this academy, which was supposed to be a safe space for women and girls, and which it still is. Uh, but interestingly, we had men and boys also saying that now boys would be disadvantaged. And so then we allowed the boys um, also to add that diversity into the mix and um, into our classes. And uh, so now as we look in at COVID-19 and the impact on our organization, one of the other projects that we run is called Women in Digital Skills, where we work with women across board. So the first thing is we wanted to pivot online. And one of the things that we did is we built a skills assessment tool um, called MyDigitalSkills.org, uh, where women could go and assess their skills um, and also connect with learning opportunities. But the challenge that we see across board is there are not a lot of women that have access to devices and also the cost of you know internet or going online um, and and like one of the earlier panelists said if there's one computer or one laptop in the home and um, the woman will have to fight tooth and nail to get access to it or the girl will have to fight tooth and nail to get access to it so what we're seeing now are these trends where some of our girls are doing amazing in our project now that they are at home, they have to do more, more house chores or more homework, or their mothers are asking them to help them in different fields. So they're not even getting enough time to practice. And the other challenge that we're seeing also with some of the women in our networks is now that they have to work remotely, and for those that don't have a lot of digital skills, and they are wondering like, um, how can they show that they still bring value to the organization? And now that there's sort of an imbalance in homework relationships, and we have a lot more women having to sort of um, um, look after the children and do a lot of homeworks, um, home chores. So they, they can't spend as much time going online to learn online tools. So for us as an organization, we have gone and having classes and we're teaching digital skills online. We're also looking at innovative ways of spreading content via WhatsApp and to keep engaging. And also we're looking at ways that we can connect with women and girls as we help them through this period because there's a lot of mental health and emotional challenges that go within the space and encouraging the innovators within our space, the women and girls that are creating solutions to keep doing that and encouraging them with um, support um, and advice and skills and, and tools. Thank you very much, Rena, Regina. And, and again, thank you for sharing your story with us. 
Um, so let me go to some of the questions. Uh, oh, by the way, I just love what you said that uh, tech is a, a, a new superpower and, and what it's an, enabled you to do. And I think that's a great, uh, a great line, a great quote for us to, to keep in mind. Um, so um, one of the questions we, we've had um, uh, from some participants in India, uh, and Regina, this follows up what, what you were saying on the cultural barriers. What can women do when they're asked to stay at home, which is made worse by COVID-19, they don't have society's backing, and they don't have the financial and technological support to be self-sufficient. Um, and other related questions, what can you do if you don't have any digital literacy or you can't afford any of these digital tools? So maybe Regina, I, I'd love to hear from all the panelists, but Regina, I'd love to start with you. Do you have any stories of students who've been in similar situations and, and what have you seen? How have they been able to, to overcome these, uh, these barriers? Um, so, yes, so we hear these stories all the time. And one of the things that is an emerging trend now are these sort of WhatsApp groups uh, where the, our students or the women in our network sort of form um, to share information. And once they can't go online or fully engage, we also within these groups, you know, sort of have an encouragement to different people. So we're talking to different stakeholders and we're, we're helping them to speak up. And, and tell their parents or talk to people about the importance, but selling it also that this also brings economic value to the family. So instead of pitching it just as, oh, I want to learn technology, or I want to learn digital skills, pitch it such that, look, the way the world is going with even COVID, it's essential that I have these digital skills in order to attract better jobs, in order to even enhance my education. So it's also about, you know, all these going against or challenging these cultural stereotypes or norms by presenting that technology skills add value. Because for most of um, our parents in the older generations or communities um, in the older generations, they don't really understand the value that technology brings. So for them, it's a waste of time. If you're going to invest maybe some money to buy data or you're going to spend some time on the computer when you could be doing something else. So it's essential that we also educate these groups on how to speak to you know, um, people in power. And worst case scenarios, we always advise, speak to an elder person who understands the importance of digital and technology, who's a, a good influence to maybe your parents or the community or somebody that can also bring in their voice. So sort of advocate, talk to other people to speak on your behalf on why it's important. And I think the final piece is, it's also essential that, you know, governments, uh, chiefs, all the community leaders, even now more than ever, join in to sort of, speak about why it's important that people get digital skills and get access to go online. Great, fantastic. So let me go to another question we've had, speaking up on your point on, you know, speaking to government. We've had one question, uh, which was, uh, it would be great to hear from speakers how they manage to engage public officials on this topic. Unfortunately, public officials are not always keen on tackling the digital gender gap. Um, so maybe I'll go to Amrote and then after that to Sonia. We'd love to hear your views as how you've tried to engage sort of government officials as you've gone on your projects. Um, yes, absolutely. Look, I think two things. Um, there are government officials and there are governments who are very much clear around sort of the gender parity, the women empowerment, be it in politics or in sort of different functions. I think that is definitely something that's picking up. Uh, as a momentum, but is it there uh, as we expect it? No. Uh, but what, what governments are interested in, and I think this is key to remember, is they're interested in finding solutions to problems that plague all our economies. Whether you're in Nigeria, we're in Ethiopia, we're in South Africa, uh, Egypt, Morocco, Senegal, across the continent, at least that I can speak of comfortably, is that if you have the right solution, if you have the right uh, innovation that allows for problem solving, in key areas that we have across the continent. I think any government is keen to pick that up. Now, I think then on the policy side, and I think this is where I go back to sort of the building the fundamentals around skills and education, is that we need to make sure that part and parcel of our education system allows and caters for young women to be part of it, right? And then the offtake of that then into be it public sector or private sector has then to allow for an equal participation of, of women. Uh, into it, but absolutely, I think you know if if governments see value in any of the solution, I think uh, who has developed it becomes secondary to uh, to what the solution can do. Thank you, Sonia. Do you have any thoughts on this? 
Sure. I mean, I could go on for quite a while, but I'll try to uh, <laughs> uh, limit myself to a couple of things. I think Regina and Amroti already uh, covered a lot. What I would say is that in our work with policymakers, and when I say policymakers, I include um, also regulators and others working in the wider kind of policy frameworks that uh, uh, really determine how the sector can evolve. W one thing that we've learned is that uh, first of all, we need to have really good, robust data to show what the reality is, right? Um, without that, it's really impossible. So starting by showing and illustrating and, and really um, tackling the problems by looking at what is the data showing, right? If we work with a government that is a resistant to, say, for example, have a very clear policy on closing the gender uh, digital gap, we have to tell them, look, unless you have a very specific targeted uh, program for women and girls, um, you're not going to close that gap if 50% of your uh, population is still not able to, to access. So you really need to figure out ways of attracting that vast uh, percentage of the population that is part of you achieving your own targets to also come online. And I, so I think we need to be very wise and very smart and strategic. And I think also many government uh, colleagues are also uh, very good at doing that with their own colleagues, right? So we, it's kind of a partnership in the making always when we work on these issues. So uh, first of all, showing the data. Then also um, having very clear examples of what can be done. It's not good enough for me or any of my colleagues to tell a government um, you have to address your gender divide without giving exact, tangible, concrete suggestions on how to go about doing that, right? So we need to be equipped with those. We need to um, really uh, demonstrate from those governments and those other partners that have done well what can others learn? That's really important. That's why for us, kind of use cases, case studies, and demonstrations of how things happen in practice um, are really powerful to have these conversations with policymakers. Um, the other thing is um, using the opportunity of the dialogue with policymakers as knowledge sharing exercises. Of course, you have to have your data, you have to have your cases, but really help policymakers understand how they can integrate those uh, innovative ways of thinking about uh, solving problems in their work. Often policymakers don't know how to do that. Policymakers often come from backgrounds that are not the ones that you've encountered uh, in understanding these kinds of issues. You know, often they come from an engineering background that was not they're not used to thinking about gender. Uh, they're not sociologists and are anthropologists. Even economists often don't even think about the gender divide. So you really need to bring all of the minds that have an ability to bring this full picture of the realities of people's lives to the table so that policy can be informed by not just hardcore economic statistics that are for the most part gender blind, but by the minds of those that work with the people that understand, you know, the realities of culture and society, the sociology and, and more. And that's really important. And this is also important in the in how you think about supporting different kinds of programs. I was listening to both Regina and Amroti in, in some of their examples. And, um, and, and I was thinking, you know, we need to be, governments need to be able to support, for example, folks that can develop uh, devices that women can afford. You know, if you're going to be working with partners that are developing devices that are always going to be um, out of reach of women's budgets, and we all know that the the gender gap in incomes is on average 30 to 50 percent, depending on the regions of the world, um, women are going to, by default, be excluded from the opportunity of purchasing a device, right? So we have to think more creatively about not only developing uh, lower cost devices, but devices that then can be used by women and girls and others. It's not just women and girls. I mean, the poor, the rural, it makes sense to them for the services and, and, and things that, for example, Regina's um, Academy and projects are already doing and some of Amrotis and many of others. So it's, it's also, it's beyond 
having really good policy discussions of integrating gender, but it's really demonstrating how things happen in reality. I think that's that's a really important um, aspect of it. But lastly, um, just to close on, on that question, Ed, I wanted to mention around services and apps. One of the things that is very frustrating um, in terms of uh, you know working in our space is that often services and um, you know solutions tech solutions in general that's why i'm so excited about this challenge um, are not really developed with the realities of people's minds um, you know at the center of the design process right so if you think about the folks that uh, Regina was talking about the girls that come to our academy, or if you think about uh, the women in, um, say, in Pakistan, they're using apps like Raji, who uh, provides information on reproductive health and uh, menstrual hygiene. Uh, those are real life problems that women and girls are uh, addressing in their lives, right? So whatever solutions we come up with at any level of the, the chain, has to make sense in people's lives, right? Uh, and, and, and women have to be very comfortable using those solutions to solve the problems of their lives, being personal health, being you know, market opportunities, being agricultural knowledge or information on crops, as some of you were mentioning, or even having access to uh, basic skills education, like those that Regina um, and uh, her academy is supporting. So I think part of the challenge here in um, that, having the dialogues with policymakers and having them be more focused on gender issues is really placing the, the problem of the gender digital divide in the context of the wider economic problems and making it clear that if we don't see that as a key variable in the equation of economic development, that equation is always going to fall apart because one of the variables is never going to be addressed, right? So we need to make sure that the whole equation of uh, digital development policy always has that in mind. Otherwise, we ourselves and those involved in policymaking, in fact, will always be failing half of their population. Thank you so much, Sonia and, and Amrote. And, and, um... I think you had an interesting quote there that economists don't always think about the gender divide. And let me tell you at the World Bank, that's not true, right? Buthena, she makes sure that all of the economists here were thinking about the gender divide all the time or as much as possible. But um, thank you so much. I, I wanna go to a question where we're having some very passionate sort of uh, uh, people on the live stream. And one of the questions, this is for you, Regina, and, and also Amrote, we'd love to hear from both of you. Um, and the question reads, how can women from Africa use tech solutions to influence their voice, their passion, and capacities within the African space? What kinds of solutions are readily available to those who are computer illiterate yet want to learn but don't have the funds? Um, so I'd love for you, and Regina, maybe you could jump in. What are some practical ways that, that people in this situation you think they could do? And what are new solutions that you really want to see uh, come out perhaps from the world from this challenge or, or that the World Bank should be supporting. So for maybe first Regina, if you want to come in and then Amrote would love to hear from you on, on that. Um, so I just wanted to first start by saying, you know, you don't even have to build like a, a very robust system. Sometimes it can be as simple as using social media channels in terms of finding that voice um, and putting out solutions out there. And what we're seeing as a, a trend now is a lot of different Facebook groups and a lot of people going online in a, in a, a sort of a different way of e-commerce where they have a product and they market on social media and they deliver, or you have people challenging positions of power. So we've seen um, young women, um, women and girls, and even some men sort of challenge things that were happening because they come out on social media or they use social media as their tool to sort of amplify their voice. In terms of the tech solutions that can be out there, if you look at Cosball, one of the, the devices that is very accessible to a lot of Africans and it's growing is our mobile devices. So we say in Ghana, we have a funny anecdote that um, there are more mobile phones than toilets um, or people. Um, and so the question is, how can you create something? And it doesn't even have to be building on mobile platforms. You can go very technical or you can use um, some tools that are out there um, to like WordPress or all these content management platforms um, that are available to create mobile friendly solutions. Um, and then you can also look at WhatsApp. How can you engage on those 
platforms or using USSSD, SMS, you know, bringing it down. And for the illiterate populations, one of the things that we also find um, can bridge that gap is going on radio. So radio as a communication platform is still a very essential way of reaching out to the masses, right? And, and for us, we, we still see you can have that, those two connection points where you are using radio to disseminate information to teach, and, and then you are helping them connect with very basic solutions on their mobile phones or very basic applications that you can create. And um, so in terms of like looking across board, you can have the very simple app, which is text-based, running on USSD on mobile. You can have something very complex, which is an AI running um, with, um, um, with data science um, and artificial intelligence um, algorithms. Or you can have a sweet middle that uh, where you're able to reach out, solving problems, you know, using different um, devices and different platforms. So now the, the range in Africa is endless. And we even saw that with COVID. So there were a lot of innovations that came out from the continent, which I'm very proud that during COVID, we were able to show up and also present that innovation. And we should keep that momentum going and, and make a lot of noise. So I think that's also the missing thing, that there are a lot of innovations happening on the continent, but we need to hear more of it and we need to celebrate those innovators. So I'm very happy that the challenge will now create that platform for such innovations. And I encourage a lot of Africans, you know, to add their voice and apply. Thank you, Regina. And we just had a comment um, where someone was commenting, for women with families in rural towns, considering how most schools have been able to take to what's up for classes it has become even more imperative for women to be connected. So very interesting that you've mentioned WhatsApp several times and how you've seen that as a, as a really powerful tool, even for those who don't have many digital skills uh, at all. So um, Amrote, let me turn to you. Do you have any insight into this question for uh, if you know what are the solutions that that women and girls can access if they don't have the funds or or digital literacy? I think look absolutely. I think Regina touched on it. Uh, in fact, sort of the the analog areas really where you start to bring in uh, people into sort of the digital world, right? So definitely radio is one. But today, frankly, you have we in Africa have more than one mobile, right? And and sort of your ability to access content is limited based on sort of affordability. But WhatsApp is definitely sort of one area where you see mass communication that's happening. So, but I want to add maybe perhaps to an earlier comment that was made, which is the what do we need to do to sort of drive uh, collectively? And and honestly, when I look at what we're doing in Africa, uh, I'll give an example. We've actually partnered with some of our Indian engineers uh, out of Hyderabad to provide mentorship program for young women, and we started the pilot in Kenya with Strathmore University. And that is, is, is very much sort of an opportunity for the young women in STEM at Strathmore to be able to connect and, and get a mentorship and have sort of a regular rhythm uh, to really understand what is the STEM career uh, in place and in action. So when I look at that and I reflect back around the earlier comments uh, coming around the what do we need to do and the similarities, I, I perhaps look back at, at what we have across uh, Africa and perhaps even a, across the emerging markets which is the how do we actually cross pollinate around best practices, around some of the talent? Uh, there's some countries that have gone a bit further ahead than, than where we are. And so how do we actually drive that knowledge sharing? And perhaps this is also the, the point that Sonia was making around policymakers for them to also understand and gain visibility around the possibilities of what is possible. So I think from a private sector perspective, we have the responsibility to show what's possible, show the best practices, but more importantly, allow for innovative ideas to come through uh, as we go along. Thank you very much. So we're, we're about uh, eight, eight minutes left. So, um, and I wanna give time for Buthena to give a, a wrap up as well. But I wanna go back to all the panelists and give you kind of a last word. But what I'd like to do is also ask a question. Um, you know, we have World Bank staff listening. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. What is the advice you'd give to World Bank staff as they design uh, their their digital infrastructure or digital application projects as they think about this issue and also to the entrepreneurs who are listening who are thinking of applying to this challenge what advice do you have for them so we would love if you could comment on that you also have within the, the director of the department listening as well so any advice you have for her uh, on this issue i'm sure she'd be very welcome to hear it um so sonia why don't we start with you and then we'll go to amrote and, and then we'll go to uh, regina Thank you, sure. So uh, since we have very limited time, I'll say um, I'll add two things. So one in terms of uh, 
your colleagues at the World Bank and what to do and how to think about uh, issues is that never make the assumption that technology is gender neutral. That's the worst mistake anyone can make. Um, technology is not only never neutral, in fact, it's quite biased in many ways. Um, and our thinking is even when we don't um, accept it. So I would say as professionals, we owe it to ourselves and those that we want to um, impact with our work to ask the real questions. Is what I'm thinking, does it, uh, is it the right thing to address the needs of the wider population? Meaning, does it also affect, you know, impact the needs of women and girls? Or is it just, uh, you know, uh, impacting supposedly um, or benefiting supposedly a kind of an average person that doesn't exist? I think doing that reflection is really important. You know, making sure that that reflection is also supported by really good data. If, if you're a professional, you need to know the reality with good data, good cases, et cetera. Don't be fooled by, you know, a, an interesting application that happens to be really powerful and already has a lot of um, uh, impact in one particular context. It doesn't mean that it will be the same in another context. So really understanding the realities, the lived realities, the experiences of people's lives is absolutely critical. So that's the first thing. And so even if you're thinking, I, I love this example of when I work with uh, colleagues at the World Bank in the past, um, so I'll be very uh, precise on this one. Um, when we're thinking about network planning, right? And we all, there's always a tendency of thinking about network planning and extending infrastructure through the kind of traditional economic corridors, right? The, you know, where roads are, et cetera, et cetera. Well, is that where women are? Are women back in the farms that are not connected to the main road? Are women uh, teaching in the schools that are not connected to the main road? Who is dominating or predominantly active in those main corridors? By asking simple questions, you re start realizing who you really affecting or have the possibility of affecting on any kind of project, in even an infrastructure project or a network planning project. In terms of, um, for entrepreneurs, I think we have two experts here on the panel, so I won't say too much, but I would say that make sure that the designs are also focused on solving real life problems. This is why, um, you know, applications and services like a rest map in Egypt is so important and so powerful, right? It addresses a real life problem of sexual harassment for women. Uh, Projects like Redimus, uh, Soronko, and uh, Laboratoria, and a similar one, um, many, many more. Uh, I don't have time to, to highlight, but solving real life problems is important, but problems that people identify, that those that we want to uh, support have identified, but not problems that we think may be problems and actually we never experienced. If one doesn't have that, a direct experience, likely we're not going to be the right ones to solve the problem. Great. Thank you. Love your point. Never make the assumption technology is gender neutral. That's fantastic to keep in mind. Um, Amrote? Thank you. Look, I think I, I, uh, I'll, I'll say the following. Uh, I think uh, my lasting words to sort of uh, our World Bank colleagues uh, who are following this is to say, one is uh, get closer to the data, get closer to the ground, and don't presume that uh, one particular technology will solve for all problems. Uh, so look at it through your industry lens, look at it uh, through sort of you know, the value chain and understand what technology can play, solve for what problem. Uh, and then I think my, my, my parting words is to say, look, you know, we need to think about this uh, at scale, right? And so as you're looking at technology as a solution, uh, start building for scale. Uh, and so from the onset, from the design, from the integration, from the stakeholders that are put together at the table, let's really bring in uh, the critical people with the right insight. And again, I go back to lead with data to make the right decisions around your investments. Thank you. Thank you, Amrote. Uh, leading with data is, is definitely critical to the World Bank's uh, approach. Um, um, Regina, let me turn to you as the last of the panelists. Um, and just so you know, we don't have time, but we do have a comment of someone's asking, um, you know, uh, he says, I remember the formative years when you used to bring the girls to learn coding in the World Bank's knowledge space in the Ghana office. 
my question is, are you still in touch with the pioneers and all the young ladies who have benefited from your creativity? How are they all doing? So yeah, doing great. yeah. and thank you so much. So, I mean, the World Bank was really a great support base when I started out to take the girls. We're still keeping in touch with them. We have a couple now that are finished university and, and are starting amazing careers. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, so following with what Sonia and Amorita said, they, they, they said everything so excellently well. I just wanted to say for World Bank, also look at these technologies that create opportunity and um, for the women in terms of economic empowerment. Because once you go online or once you have access or once you're creating content, the next question is, you know, how can this woman use this new um, sort of digital skill or tool to sort of bring economic empowerment to her family, to her community? So that she can be part of decision making so it's also looking at how do you with um, giving these women skills and access how do you create more opportunity for them to have dignified and fulfilled work or to bring economic empowerment to them for entrepreneurs and um, sonia and Amorati also said it all you know really understand the problem that you're trying to solve look also at the scale factor but most importantly look at how you can bring something unique and think about it as it can be it can cut across africa um, so now there's not so much of a local challenge, uh, but the challenge that you have, if you find an innovative solution and the solution can work across Africa, like Amorosi said, you, you can pitch it to government, you can pitch it to private sector, you know, you can really reach scale with it. So really be intentional about the problem that you're trying to solve and be innovative and know that your solution can reach across not only the continent, the African continent, but the world. Regina. So I'm going to turn over to Puthena for the last word. Puthena would love to hear your thoughts, comments. And we do have one question actually directed at you on the live stream, which is what informed this discussion at the World Bank? Is it a strategic focus or direction for the World Bank? If so, what is the goal and what are the baseline figures of the indicators that you are tracking? So a um, lot of interest in why are we doing this and, and where do you see this going, Puthena? Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me let me first start by thanking our panelists. This was an incredible discussion, a very good contribution from from all of you. And I think it really helps, you know, think about the topic uh, under an, an urgency lens. I think we've been talking about the gender digital divide for a long time. Uh, it is very stubborn and uh, we need to look at it uh, with a new approach. Uh, I like what Sonia mentioned, you know, we didn't need to have a COVID-19 <laughs> to elevate the agenda to the next level, but I think uh, it's also an opportunity for us to, to think outside of the box uh, because, you know, not tackling this issue, I think, will have uh, uh, deeper consequences for the economy uh, at large. So clearly, you know, um, tech uh, is not gender neutral and we cannot afford to be gender blind. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, all this discussion really shows that we need to break the topic again, louder and clearer, and we need to think outside of the box. Uh, I liked a lot, you know, how the panelists brought the issues about the ecosystem. I mean, this is not, you know, I mean, the gender lens really is something that needs to bring the other dimensions from connectivity to device affordability to the issue about uh, you know, uh, what is the relevant content, you know, the, all the elements about the broader ecosystem, we need to look at them uh, with, with the gender lens to make sure that uh, we, we, can make, um, we can make a difference. Uh, I like also what you mentioned, I mean, there are a lot of success story out there. So how do we amplify the message? There are good solutions that happened. How do we make sure that they're known? So we build on successes. So this is this is really good and we look forward to great ideas from the entrepreneurs out there who can uh, you know bring those ideas to the fore and we try to together uh, you know bring all minds together to really make a difference so for us in the bank this is clearly um, a good you know strategy for us we are thinking about the importance of digital uh, development as part of reaching our twin goals we talk about the importance of digital economy. If we do it without a gender lens, we're talking about an economy that is not inclusive. So that to respond to the question, uh, we need to have a good discussion about the gender element in order for us to have an inclusive digital economy and the digital technology is very important to reach our objectives uh, of, of development for all. 
So thank you, Ed, and back to you. Thank you, Puthana. I just want to thank our panelists again. Uh, and also, I want to thank Ellen from the CTA for joining. Let's give everybody a big hand uh, virtually. <laughs> and I also want to thank the team that put this together, Marisol uh, on the gender team, and Sharada for answering questions, and also Anne, who's our communications lead. We're really pulling this event together. Really a lot of great thoughts and comments. And thank you all uh, on the live stream for, for joining as well. Again, so we'll be posting other responses and uh, we'll be back in touch. But thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Take care.